Hey everybody, hello to the group here in front of me. Hello everybody out there in Facebook world. Um, as you've heard before, my name is Alex Camelio from agentinnercircle.com. Again, that's Alex Camelio from agentinnercircle.com. And uh, we're live streaming this today. And the reason we're live streaming this is because of what I do in my daily practice, which is back about 10 years ago, I uh, started a tech company, built that tech company up. About three years ago, I sold it. Got great opportunity of the company I actually sold it to, asking me to partner with him on another company, which is a venture capital and incubator company. I then got lucky enough to become the CEO of that group. And essentially what we do is we either acquire or invest and then help companies grow. We go in and we say, okay, you're doing really, really well in these parts, but this part over here, maybe not so well. So let's help you grow out of that aspect, right? But before we dive into that, I got to tell you how I met Jay because it was, now let me ask you, in the room, show of hands, how many people have seen these? I motivate cards from Jay, good handful of you. So for the folks that don't, I'll give you the brief intro on what this does. And I've shared this with my community before too. But basically the way this works is it's a deck of cards, okay? Um, Jay can certainly set you up with one of these. But it's a deck of cards, and every single day you wake up, you pick one of them, and it says on it, today, I choose to feel incredible, or fabulous, or magnificent, or amazing, or spectacular, or exceptional, or unbelievable, or, unphenomenal, or, or phenomenal. And the reason he does this is because there's one question that, that's the most asked question ever, right, Jay? Right? We all walk up to each other and we go, what do we do? Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. And then we move on and it's mundane and you're on to the rest of your day, right? Is that I'm good even part of asking someone how they're actually doing? Now, what if you all of a sudden go, I'm fantastic. Everybody starts, they take a pause and they go, well, wait, wait a second. You're fantastic. What do you mean you're fantastic? Well, I'm just good. How are you fantastic, right? It's that stop in logic. Okay, and the reason I bring this story up in the first day of meeting Jay is he had just gotten these. He ran into a buddy of mine, um, Mitch Durfee, at a coffee shop down in, in St. Albans and broke him out of the package. He was so excited to show him. And at the same time, we're doing a, a seven-day challenge in one of our groups. And I looked at these and I said, you know why these make so much sense? Is because what these are called in our world, in the psychology world, is what's called a pattern interrupt, okay? Pattern interrupt. And it's one of the concepts we're actually gonna be talking about today and how to write better emails, is a pattern interrupt. And what I mean by that is, our pattern continues to be, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? And we all move on with our day, right? But if all of a sudden you say, I'm amazing, what did you just do? You interrupted the pattern of what somebody's doing every day, and now it forces them to psychologically think about the thing that's right in front of them, okay? So that's the big trick, and that's one of the big tricks that we're gonna be talking about today is email, you know, we can go over tips and tricks of how to manage lists and all of that sort of stuff, but in reality, the theory to how we're sending emails and why we're sending emails tends to be the problem and the difficulty that we have, in getting a response to those emails, all right? So, we're gonna go into building email that works. As you heard, I'm Alex, I've done some cool stuff. Um, so, we're gonna talk today about something a lot that's called direct response marketing, okay? Direct response marketing. And this is something that has been around a very long time. I'm not new to this, um, but it has been around a lot longer than me. The guy that really started it is a guy named Dan Kennedy. Um, he wrote a bunch of books back in the day called the No BS Marketing Books, great series of books. A lot of people have adapted that as time has gone on. But what we're really talking about today is what actually gets people to respond, and in this course, in email, right? Very specifically, what gets them to respond to you via email, all right? So keep moving on here. Okay, so you might have heard of some of this before. 
the notion is that you're creating some sort of irresistible offer, something that they cannot say no to, or they cannot say, you know, I don't want this thing. And a lot of which has to do with the understanding of your clients and what they really want and what they really need. Because in reality, most of the emails that we're sending, we can get into a lot of bait ideas and things like that, but a lot of the emails that we're sending right now have nothing to do with our clients. They're very important to us and what we think is important, right? They're very important to maybe our business. But a lot of times what gets lost in the shuffle is, why do they care? And I always think about it, and, and one of my colleagues gave me a great tip. He goes, whenever you're writing an email, I want you to think about one radio station. I said, well, okay, what's, what's that? He goes, WIFM. Anybody, any guesses as to what WIFM is? What radio station that is? What's in it for me? Because I'll tell you right now, if there's nothing in it for that email on the other side, let me ask you, are you going to open it? Not, not one chance. You get some email that's an update about wonderful this, that, and the other, but it doesn't mean anything to you. Think about your busy lives, right? And what you have going on in your busy life every single day. Now let me ask you, is there anybody in this room without a full inbox? Anybody? Or, or, or a full spam folder, right? Or all three tabs on Gmail totally full? We're all at that point, right? So you start going, well, how do I get out of that? How do I get out of that mess? That big, you know, overarching sort of this group of emails, this, this content of email, hundreds of emails of people going, read this, read that, read this blog, read this thing, right? Here's the thing though, okay? What we want to do is we want to create pieces of, and I'm going to write this down before we continue here, all right? It's going to be W-I-F-M, okay? What's in it for me? Because before you start writing any email, any email sequence, series, whatever it is, the first thing you need to be thinking about is what is in it for my client? Why would they care, okay? Now to do that, you can create some really interesting things, right? You can create an educational flyer or some sort of resource or give them a book that might be pertinent to them or write a white paper on something that might be really interesting to them when they need it, when they need that piece of information, okay? But to do any of these things, we actually need to understand who our clients are when we're writing these emails. Now, I ask these questions, we actually do this yearly within our organization, is we, and actually, I gave you guys a little, tip, a little thing that at the end here, we're going to be doing a giveaway. One of the piece of that is actually all the slides as a PDF. So if you guys want the slides as a PDF at the end, feel free to give me your email addresses, um, and I'll send those out to everybody. But we actually, on a yearly basis, we sit down and we ask these questions, okay? What keeps them awake at night? Indigestion, boiling up their esophagus, eyes open, staring at the ceiling. Okay? What are they afraid of? What are their fears? Now, we do this a lot in the real estate market, and let's say we're talking about a, a new buyer, right? Some of those fears might be, I might spend the rest of my life renting my home and living in a building with, with neighbors. I don't want that. That could be the biggest fear. But there's no way in, in heck that I'm ever going to get a loan, or there's no way in heck that I'm ever going to get X, Y, and Z. Okay? Or, on the other hand, right? I've always wanted to play insert instrument, but I'm really nervous that those first few lessons or making that commitment to do it might not be right for me, okay? So maybe you do something a little different than what everybody else is doing. Maybe you say, 
hey, for those folks out there interested in trying an instrument, trying something new, we're running a free seminar on learning how to play guitar, right? We have guitars provided. We have up to whatever number of guitars provided for you. You don't even have to buy one. Come on in and learn, take your first lesson for free. We've got you covered. Well, then guess what? Is the second lesson going to be free? No. But did a whole heck of a bunch of people just tell you that they're really interested in possibly buying gu guitar lessons? Absolutely. So now you've taken a list of thousands and thousands of people in the area that you might be marketing to, and you've narrowed that list down to those 30 people or 40 people who are your target demographic, who are the people that you want to be emailing consistently. Okay? So again, we have that, we got to get that better understanding of our clients. Let me keep going. What are they angry about? Who are they angry at? In fact, you talked about one just as we started, Jay, right? That, we, that this trust group couldn't get those mortgages done in time. And there's that, there's that wording out there, so on and so forth. So they're afraid that by working with this group, that the mortgage is not going to get done in time. Okay? That's a fear. We just address the fear. Thing, there are a few things that sell in this world. Okay? A things that take pain away, right? B, things that make you either money or make you, um, I hate to say it, but look more popular. It's true. It's absolutely true. People buy the, you know, Escalade over the Ford Explorer for certain reasons. Because, I mean, we've all heard of the one-upping the neighbor, right? People buy stuff for that. And the third reason people buy stuff is health. That's it. It's the only, can anybody else name anything beyond those three categories as to why people buy something? Such as? Health. Emotional response, you feel better. Health. If you're buying it for that reason, health. If you're buying it for the other reason, which is why a lot of art gets purchased, which is I own this while my neighbors only own that, right? That's the other world. But those are the only two still. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. So if the, the folks on live, gentlemen in the back said another way, great way to break it down is you're either moving toward pleasure or away from pain. I didn't catch your name. Your name? What was that? Sean Cheney said that. You're either moving away from pleasure, uh, or sorry, away from pain or toward pleasure. That would have been really funny is the opposite, right? <laughs> So the reason we say that is, and we're going to go into the other side of this. So we, we talked about the pain side of this, right? What are their top three daily frustrations? What trends are occurring in their businesses or lives? Now we flip that. We flip from the pain side to the positive side, and we start asking these questions. What do they secretly, ardently desire the most? What do your clients really, really want in this world? Is it that they want to learn to play an instrument or is it they want to impress somebody that they're with, right? Is it that, and this is because this comes from you spending time with your clients and having an understanding and asking them a lot of questions. And it's natural. You do it naturally all day. They show up for something. Oh, hey, what brought you to us? Oh, that's fantastic. Why, you know, can I ask you a few questions about this? People love to tell you their stories. I mean, I think we all know that. Right? Nobody is short on, on wanting to tell you their story when you ask. You have to ask them what those stories are. So we'll just go through this quickly. Do they have their own language? Like if you're selling to engineers or you're selling to artists or things like that, right? do they have their own? Um, who else has tried selling something similar 
and how has that effort failed? So I think a lot of times we see things in the community and go, boy, that could have been a really good effort, but this, that, or the other, other didn't go quite right, or they could have done something different. Don't be afraid to go out there and do that yourself, right? We're not stealing ideas. And in fact, if you're worried about stealing ideas, we shouldn't even be in the business world because uh, there's actually a great movie from, from the uh, mid nineties called The Pirates of Silicon Valley. And it's basically about how Bill Gates and Steve Jobs went back and forth and back and forth stealing from one another. And that's all they did is they just stole back and forth. And there's this great line in the movie where Steve Jobs get pissed, gets pissed at Bill Gates and goes, you stole this from me, you stole it, blah, 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 blah. And Bill Gates goes, so what? You've stolen this from them and this from them and this from them. Don't be mad because I'm better at stealing it than you are. And Steve Jobs kind of went, you know, well, I can't really deny. I mean, Xerox had an iPad before Apple did. Steve Jobs snapped that one right up, right? We can go on with that sort of stuff all day, okay? But the stuff that's interesting here is that what we start to think about is what do our clients really want and what are their pain points? Because if we don't understand that to begin with, then the rest of what we're gonna talk about today in terms of emails is all for naught, all right? Now let's get into an idea of ways to build items that we call irresistible offers, things that people essentially can't turn down, okay? They're gonna say yes to opening and clicking through on that email no matter what. So we do this in real estate. So some, some trip, ticks, tr yeah, trips that, tricks and tips that we use, right? We write a report called five tips to get the most money for your home. Right? And then we have agents who send a monthly newsletter that has nothing to do with real estate whatsoever. And in it, it there's a little tagline that says, if you're ever interested in, your selling, in selling your home, make sure that you uh, get in touch with me for this, this report. Five tips to get the most money for your home. I wanna make sure you're set up to do that. Okay? Now they're getting that on a monthly basis and they might not click through on every month they get it. But let me ask you, any guesses as to how many emails it takes on average to get someone to respond? Seven, seven and a half. She had it right there, seven and a half. Seven and a half emails is on average what it takes to get people to respond to your email, okay? And do you know what the reason is? Do you know why? They're busy. You're not bugging them. What was that? It doesn't meet their needs at that moment. Exactly. What she just said, she just says, it, did, it doesn't meet their needs at that moment, right? On any given day, we all have a set of things to do. And in reality, on any given day, we probably have more things to do than we should have accepted. Can I get like, can I get, like an amen for that one, right? Because we have all, we are all right there. If we're all business owners in this room, almost all of us, I can promise you we are all overcommitted. I know I am, right? So sometimes that email might not be pertinent, might not be the top of mind, but we want to figure out ways to get into that and get into people's inboxes. So we want to come up with some things that are reasons for them to click through. Date things everyone must know before buying a home. Create a report. It's something like that, right? Or let's, let's go back. We, we had someone uh, in Mitch's class when I came and sat in a month or two ago who's in the music industry or let's say the art industry. The five things everyone must know before buying a painting, right? The 10 things you must know to not get swindled when buying art. That sound like a report that people who are already buying art might be interested in? The 10 things you absolutely must know to not get swindled when buying your next piece of art. That sounds, if, you, if you're an art collector, you're a buyer, is that something that sounds a little more likely, like you're gonna click on that and go, 
oh yeah, maybe I should read that thing. Even if I already, in fact, here's what we do that's really kind of tricky. The eight mistakes even savvy real estate investors make. Download this free report and they give up their email address for you to do so. Okay? Think about that. The eight mistakes even savvy real estate investors make. You're not charging them for it. You're giving them a piece of information, a piece of value, and saying, hey, give me your email address for that. Now that opens a dialogue, okay? Now this opens a dialogue between you two because they've just brought themselves out and said, hey, I'm a real estate investor, or hey, I'm really into art, or hey, I'm really into music, or hey, I'm really into whatever it might be. Okay, so now that we've understood our clients a little bit better, we start coming up with pieces of bait, pieces of things that they cannot resist saying, oh, well, heck yeah, I'm gonna give you my email address for that piece of bait. Like, let me ask you, we're going through this today, and I just said to you guys, Hey, I'm gonna make this slide available as a PDF at the end of this class. How many of you think you're actually gonna want that? Most of you probably are. You're gonna give me your email address. And then guess what? We're gonna open an email dialogue between us. You think I'm gonna send you one email? Now, now you're all going, never mind, I'm not giving you my email address. I'm not giving you my. But here's the thing about that seven email trick. Those seven to eight to 10 emails should not be the same email. In fact, what we do is we do automated campaigns that are like anywhere from 35 to 45 emails over 250, 260 days as our follow-up campaigns to some of this stuff. So once someone has addressed, then we start emailing them, and then we're gonna get into some of the tricks as to how to actually get them involved, right? These same resources to give up the emails, they don't have to be written. They can be videos, right? Eight secrets for saving thousands when finding, buying, buying, and financing your next home. And I apologize, a lot of these are real estate. You've got to realize that's what I do for a career. I mean, I have a, a community of 50,000 real estate agents. We actually just got listed as one of the top 30 real estate blogs in the world, uh, number eight, actually. So, woohoo. Um, Feedspot ranked us that, which I thought was pretty cool. So, in any event, we get back to it. You can do videos, right? How to, how to avoid seven costly mistakes when selling your home. Things of that nature, right? And if any of you have industries that you want ideas for, shout them out. I've done this a long enough time. I'm pretty decent on the fly in terms of coming up with some ideas for industries. So if you have industries I haven't talked about yet at all, like, let me ask. Throw out, what are some industries out here? Senior communities, all right. So the communities themselves, rent apartments. Okay, are these mostly one level units or are these, like would these be considered single level living or would these be considered community? Okay, so single level, level. Ah, single level living. Um, are they purchasing the home or is it rented through your organization? Rented, okay. So, moving, decluttering, and downsizing is a huge part of that, isn't it? Right? So what about something, a video, a, a resource, a written resource on the five things you need to know to declutter and move, or well, you, know, you can come up with better language, but that you need to know how to do or help your parents do before moving in, before moving, right? Because at that point in time, they haven't made the decision about where they're moving yet. All they're doing is in their mind, they're getting ready because what's the pain point for the kids who are moving their parents into these homes? They're up late at night going, oh my God, my dad's house is full of crap and we're gonna have to move all this stuff and some of it we're not gonna wanna keep, some of it we're not, and how are we gonna deal with all this and where's it gonna go and who's gonna do what and what are the tricks, like, right? That's their. Yep. Right. So, and, and what the comment she made was there's, there's sort of that still that, that 
bias of the old school, you know, homes like senior living homes versus the new retirement communities and how those are so different and sort of dispelling some of those myths. I might, you know, I might wait a little bit and do that down the road as you start to get them into the funnel. That might be more PR stuff because my fear is not as much in my, I just know my parents are both, my dad's over 70. Um, my mom's just getting to 70 and it's not going to happen that soon, but you know, I'm a smart enough guy and I'm an only child. So I'm a smart enough guy to know that I'm going to be the one handling all of it. And in my mind, <laughs> my, I always joke, me and my mom have this running joke. This sounds terrible. <laughs> I always joke with her. I go, don't worry, mom, I'm going to put you in the best house money can buy. And she goes, yeah, Alex, that's your house. And I go, oh God. <laughs> right. So it's again, I think, I think you're right. One of those preconceived notions is that folks don't understand the difference between these communities and so on. So maybe that's a, a video that you put out, you know, you walk through the place and you say, Hey, this is how it's so different. This is what we do differently. This is what we all that sort of stuff, but that's PR, right? To me, the first pain point, the first thing I'm going to run into is what? Before moving in, before even making a choice as to where I'm going to move this person, I've got to worry about all the stuff that's in the house, right? And then once I've worried about all that, then I start worrying about, and here's where these automated sequences come in, and we'll get back to this, I promise, all right? We'll get back to this, because this is where the automated sequences are, right? So we'll do another one. You could do a video on how to avoid seven costly mistakes when selling your home, right? And then we're gonna use this, what we call bait, to pre-qualify people and get their email addresses in. So we can be running ads, we can be sending blast emails to our existing, existing audience, right? To our huge lists of people, offering them some piece of bait, some piece of information that then demographically pre-qualifies them. And what I mean is they stick their hand up and they go, hey, I'm in that boat right? I'm in the boat of those people that really, really need this piece of information. So I'm probably also interested in buying this other thing. Okay. So you start them down that path. We've even gone as far as um, free book offerings. Some of us have written books. Mitch Durfee in the area has done a really good job of, you know, free plus shipping book offers, right? He'll give you his book, but then there's he makes money because then you've bought his book, you've read his book, now you're on the same page. Now you go back and you go, well, can you help me with this? And can you help me with that? And can you do this? And you can you do that? All those sorts of things. We've even worked out deals with other authors where we give their books away for free, free plus shipping. Author gets the publicity out of it. They also get ranked up on their Amazon bestseller list because it still shows as a sale, right? but it's, it doesn't work out quite the same way, idea that way. And a big piece of that is understanding your costs. If you're ever going to spend real money on your bait, on the items that you're going to use to draw people in, you really need to understand your what's called cost of acquisition, how much money you're willing to commit to get a client through the door and to actually sign with you. So keep that in mind. Another one we do is a really good... And you, Jay, you do this, don't you? The first one on that list. List of community vendors. You did. A little bit. A little bit, right? So realtors, this is huge. They figure out all the vendors that they work with on a daily basis. The best mover, the best storage company, the best plumber, the best etc cetera, etc cetera. because of some rules they cannot say the best mortgage person but we'll go past that and they come up with that list and for everybody that just bought a home that's moving into that home they say hey folks i have this really great resource for you it's the six things that you need to the vendors that we use for people that are moving into a new home these are my absolute best. I've used them. I recommend them. They're the absolute best in the world. Now, if you get really tricky with this, those vendors will actually end up paying for your marketing. No joke. 
because you get enough you get enough people going man i want your community vendor list because it's so good can my aunt susie have it can my my uncle joe have it can my whoever right you go back to your vendors and you go hey vendors this thing is getting pulled like crazy in fact if you do it the right way with your vendors you say vendors i'd like to have you offer me a special coupon a 10 percent discount if my real if my person brings in this sheet this email whatever to your restaurant they're going to get 10 percent off their bill right next thing you know the restaurant starts calling you going hey I'm getting a bunch of these 10% things. That's really, really awesome, right? And then six months later, you go back to them and you say, hey, vendor, how much business have you done off of those 10% cards? And they, they go, boy, I've done a lot of business. And you go, well, what would you think about sharing some of the cost of the marketing on that with me? I think that'd be really great if we could share the cost of the marketing of this because you're getting so much business. I don't want you to take all of it, but a piece of it right share that with me right so now this thing that your clients are literally asking for turns into a revenue stream on the other side because of the vendors that you're able to work with it's a really really interesting sort of thing um another one is local subscription or tickets and we're talking like movie ticket giveaways you have no clue how many people will respond to an email simply because it's like free movie tickets kind of stuff it's it blows my mind in fact think about it this way right every year how many people succumb to IRS scam phone calls that are going around right every single year how many people succumb and click on that wrong email address because they're sucked into some wild whatever type of thing right well think about that for a second and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way in terms of, you know, we don't, we're not here to scam people. We're not here to steal money. But think about it in the same tactics. They use these tactics to get people to click on those emails. What, what kind of stuff did they say, right? The first thing they said in the phone calls or the emails, what did they say to you? You owe money to the IRS, and if not, we're going to send police to your door. Now, how many, what small percentage of the population has that rattling around in the back of their mind going, oh, shit, the IRS, what are they going to do? They're going to come to my door. Well, what are they, you know what I mean? So on. You've hit that nerve. They hit the pain point. It's the same concept. If you can understand what those pain points are, like you said, head toward pleasure or away from pain, if you can figure out what those are and target your emails toward those things, I absolutely promise you, absolutely promise you, you are going to get more of a response, okay? Now, we have tons and tons of methods to get looked at, and we're gonna get into writing some captivating subject lines and captivating emails, because up until this point, all we've talked about is A, what is our client's pain points, right? And then we've gotten into what kind of things can they not resist? What are some ideas for things that they may not be able to resist clicking through on that email on? But now we actually have to get them to open the email, right? Click into the email and then move on from there. So what's our goal? Number one is to get it looked at, right? The trick for this is we want it to look like wanted media okay and we'll get into that in, in some detail secondly is to get it read and ideally get it kept which means great headlines and captivating copy okay great headlines and captivating copy and the last is getting a response and we're going to use some some great calls to action to get responses from people for this all right so now First is get it delivered and looked at. For all of the business owners out there, how many of you are sending your business emails from your business name? Let's all stop that. Any, any guesses as to why? It's not personal enough. Does anyone care? No offense to peoples. In fact, 
I didn't, didn't know this. My parents used to bank with people's trust before they got bought out in New Hampshire. We, when we lived in New Hampshire 20 years ago, uh, people's trust was, I guess, in a few different states, different areas, and different people, I guess there's a different people's trust. But the reason I say it is, would you want an email from Alex Camilio or would you want an email from Agent Inner Circle? You want an email from Alex, right? Because once I become a big organization, I'm a big organization. Some groups are getting around this. They're saying like Alex Camilio at Agent Inner Circle, right? They're, they're in the, the who this is from reply to kind of stuff. It's Alex Camilio at. But beyond just the personal aspect of this, there's another little trick, which is that Google and Outlook, Microsoft, and all of the others, well, guess what? They scan your emails before they come to your inbox. Do you know how some of your emails, now let me ask, how many folks have Gmail in here? Pretty much all of you. So you, you see now where it says your, your main inbox and then promotions and whatever, right? Social, thank you, and then promotions. She's a better memory than I do, jeez. You, you wanna help me teach? Because you've been on point today, I love this. So when you think about that though, right, when they're scanning through emails, that's actually one of the things they use to trigger which one of those categories or spam that they're sending it to. If it's coming from Alex Camilio, it has a far less likelihood of going into spam or going into that, that you know, promotions folder than it does going into your actual inbox. So that's number one. The next one is list quality matters, okay? Now let me give you a, a tip of what I mean. So when we acquired Agent Inner Circle, do you know what size our list was? 85,000 people. You know what the first thing I did to that list was? Cut it in half. Everyone's going, wait, what, right? Our list to start was 85,000 people. The problem is, is that you know how Google does SEO for your website, where they rank your website and how great your website is and where it shows up in rankings and all that sort of stuff? Well, all of the email providers actually do the same thing, but they base it on some different criteria. So just like we were talking about your name versus your company name being different, some of the other criteria they use are what's called list quality, which means if you've been running a list for years and years and it's 30,000 people deep, but only 5% of people open it and less than a percent of people click through, they start looking at that list and going, well, that list is really, really junky that's an old list, nobody's really interested in it, even if it is important information, right? And they stop putting you in as many inboxes because your quote unquote list quality has dropped, okay? So there are some things to do that, there are some companies out there who can help with this. Um, one that I used, it was a tiny bit, exp I wouldn't say it was a tiny bit expensive. I ran, um, let me back up when I say list quality. Things that they include in list quality are things like, does your list have emails like info at, or support at, or quality at? Because if you're sending emails to quality at or info at, they look at that and they go, that's not a person. You're not emailing a real person. You're not following canned spam rules here, right? So the, one of the first things I did is we went through and started looking at our list and going, how many, how many of these people are simply info at whatever.com, support at whatever.com, Mickey Mouse at whatever.com, those kinds of emails. We started pulling those from our list entirely, okay? I took that list of 85,000, pulled it back to about 40,000, okay? Then, to that 
other set, that other set of 40,000, what I did was I ran what's called a reactivation campaign. Okay? And it's literally, I ran three emails, it was a series, and the three emails basically said, hey, we've noticed that you haven't been clicking through on these emails in a long time. Here's the value of why we're sending you these emails on a weekly basis. If you really want to stay on the list, click here, enter your, you know, and you're good to go. If not, you know, we're, we're just going to keep removing you, from, we'll have you removed from the list, and you can keep going on. Guess what? That list went from 40. Now we're back up to 50. About half of that is what, a little more than half of that is what we've done. But we had a, over a couple thousand people who actually reactivated, who actually said, oh my God, I'm going to get pulled off this list? Geez, I really should get myself back on this list. Well, the moment someone reactivates and clicks through to reactivate, what do you think Google and all those people behind the scenes start doing to that same person? Think that's going to start showing up in their inbox when now they've double opted in to your email campaigns, right? So that's when I say list quality matters. Now, one group I used personally for this, running large lists to pull all those types of support ad and so on, uh, it's a company called datavalidation.com. They actually run it to see, like, they run pings to see if the email addresses still even exist. They tell you about all those support at and info at and all that sort of stuff. I think for a list of like 80,000 I spent, I wanna say it was like 250 bucks to run the entire list and that was a pretty huge list. Um, not the cheapest options, but it definitely helped us in terms of managing a list, managing a high size list um, and getting some quality out of it. The next one is, um, big, uh, big trick is when you're sending an email, it should be going to the person's first and space and last name. Some email providers are really good about this. Uh, MailChimp, for example, is very, very good about this. That's what we use personally. That's what I use personally. Some others, a little tricky to set it up, but they pretty much all allow you to do it. But when it's a two, the two line should be first space, last name. First, if you have that, if that's all you have, but ideally first and last name. And try, especially in the subject line, not to use too much advertising copy. And what I mean by that is free. Like if you use free in your subject line, Google, Microsoft, all these other guys start to think, Oh my God, this is an advertising email. To, to, the, to the promotions box you go, right? Right? But you can get around that. Be tricky with language. Get this without spending a dime. Their algorithm's not that slick yet. It's pretty smart. But if you start getting tricky with your language and sticking away from the very, very advertising type copy, where it's, like I said, free this, or download this here, or be sure to X kind of a thing, especially in email chains people haven't already um, worked with, right? You're gonna see there, you don't want too much advertising style copy in those emails that you're actually writing out to people. Okay, now these are some examples of some headlines that we use that we know work, okay? So, who else wants, right? Let's start, let's start for the group. Let's start filling in some ideas here. Who else wants, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Who else wants to move, out, move away from those loud neighbors and buy a home without spending a penny more than you do right now. Anybody else? Any other ideas? Who else wants for your business? You know, the gym? Who else wants? Come on, man. I'm putting. There it is. 
Give me the high five. I'm serious about that. He just said, who else wants to get rid of that dad bod? Because the first thing you did there is you offered some social proof of who else. Somebody's already done this, meaning if they've done it, you can do it too, right? So who, uh, <laughs> that Mr. Dad bought over here as he eats a, oh, that's all right, he's getting some fruit. I, I see that. I, and I shouldn't be saying anything anyway. What do you mean? Yeah. So the question he just asked is, doesn't that restrict your market to males? Yes, absolutely does. And that's what you want. Because if I'm not speaking to anyone specifically, I'm not speaking to anybody. That's the whole trick of this. Because then a week from now, you're going to send another email that's very, very specific to middle-aged females. And then you're going to send a very specific one to all of the college kids who just got back, right? Can't find your perfect gym now that you've moved into your new college? Check us out, right? But you're speaking to a demographic very specifically. And if you've run those pre-bait items beforehand correctly, those people have already told you they want to be on that list, right? Because you might have, you might have already offered a free report online to the seven tricks that you need to get rid of that dad bod, right? And they've downloaded that. Now they're on your email list. And then a week later, you send them an email that says, who else wants to get rid of that dad bod, right? And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and we move on from there, okay? So keep going, right? Are you? And what I mean by this is, are you also? tired of. Are you also tired of those no noisy upst upstairs neighbors and want to do something about it? Right? Pe people don't feel like they're, they don't, they don't want to feel like they're alone. How to, everyone loves the how to email, how to do this, right? We can go very, very specific and pre-qualify and say, if you are, you can, right? We've seen those from, from mortgage folks actually pretty recently. Like, uh, if you're currently renting and have a credit score of over 680, we can get you into a home. How many mortgage emails have you seen similar to that? Might not speak to you, but the renter who's got that noisy upstairs neighbor and the credit of 680, 685 who thinks they can't buy a home, to them they're going, Oh my God, my dreams came true, click, right? And you start getting those responses, okay? Thousands, now millions, and this is the perfect one. This is the one that, that we love. And again, for your gym, thousands have now gotten rid of that dad bod, even though they thought they never could. Wanna see how? question mark and it becomes a cute video of you and your promotion and what you do with all your clients and that stuff when in reality we all know I mean business owners I like to think of us as realists to some extent we all know it's just perseverance and and like doing it being active and you know pushing forward there are some easier tips and tricks and so on certainly having someone there is helpful but what I'm saying here is you're trying to speak to a specific demographic. You're not trying to get everybody in one email. You're very specifically trying to target a group because when we talked about that whole quality of list component, it's not about having one big huge list per se. You might have to score it as one big list, but when we do it, it's one list that's segmented into very small segments of groups of a thousand people here and a thousand people there and a thousand people here that we run very, very specific and directed marketing toward, okay? It's not, it has nothing to do with, you know, these one magic bullet is gonna get everybody type of email tricks. It's that the notion of how we're dealing with emails is a little different and we're gonna take you up a notch here. So. 
I uh, gave you some ideas for headlines. If you want to test your own headlines, uh, the site looks old, but it actually works really, really well. Um, it's aminstitute.com slash headline. Uh, what it does is you plug in your headline, and it gives you an idea of intellectual, empathetic, and spiritual um, connection that it'll have with people, how, much, how many of those words you're using type of thing. Um, the other big one is we use is Grammarly. Anybody else in the room use Grammarly? So a couple hands. Grammarly is awesome for the folks that don't. Um, basically what it does is uh, there are some plugins that even work in your email and in the things you're already working in, or you can just go to Grammarly.com and plug in the whole paragraph. It's going to give you all sorts of typos and errors and errors in phrasing and words and all that sort of stuff. And frankly, I want you to disregard most of it. And here's why. Because unless I use Grammarly in every single little process, does it sound like me? No. Right? I want these emails, I want you to get this email and look at it and go, oh, isn't that nice? Alex sent me an email. That's pretty cool. Nice. Alex sent me that. Even if it was automated, even if it was the system doing it, I want, it, I want you to feel that way that I personally sent you that email. Okay? So give this an idea. But the reason I said to use Grammarly other than to disregard most of the, you know, I don't want to say spelling checks of it, but the real true grammar type stuff is we've heard this in politics consistently. If you are writing at any higher than a fifth grade level, tone it down a notch. I don't care what industry you're in, it doesn't matter. Fact, just fact. If you are writing at higher than a fifth grade level, for any of the emails that you're writing out there, you're up here, most of your audience is here in terms of their, their ability to read it. And let's go a step even further. Even if those people are smart enough to understand it, when you get an email that is an email that is challenging, not challenging, but like takes some real mental work, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go, oh, I wanna read that, but not right now. And then when you, the moment you say not right now, what happens? Gone. You're never going to do it again. It's gone. Okay? So make sure that you're writing at that fifth, sixth grade level. We don't want to see people writing at, you know, college level emails to people. Maybe, maybe if you're trying to sell to doctors specifically, and that's where we talked about the language and using their language. But like if maybe if you're trying to sell to neurosurgeons, Okay, fine, you got me there. But outside of that group specifically, we want you to keep it at a very, very low reading level. Um, simply in that folks will not read and will not continue um, to read as they go on. All right? So uh, let me go back there one. This is HubSpot's last year, and I pulled a few. They, pu they published their top 30, but uh, I, I pulled a few that were my favorites. JetBlue sends an email. These are the best responded to subject lines, open rate subject lines out of HubSpot over the last year. JetBlue sends an email. 1,750 points for you, Valentine's flowers, and more for them. Did they talk about airlines once? No. They talk about tickets ever? No. They talk about selling you a credit card? No. What did they say? What's in it for me? All they told you was, there's some stuff in this for you if you want to open this email. And they sent it right around Valentine's Day. Timely. And what's in it for you? Now, you open the email, and it might be, you know, a credit card promo. It might be some of these other things. But guess what? It's true. Sign up for the credit card. You get the points, plus you get all those things. They weren't lying to you. They were just doing the best job their marketing department could to get you to open that email. Next one, rock the cover of the year from Etsy, right? Now, everybody who, know, who wants to be trendy, remember one of the things we said that you could sell? Being popular, being trendy, one-upping your neighbor, right? 
Well, everybody who's reading Etsy wants to know what co what's the color of the year, right? Because if I'm not wearing the color of the year, oh my God, what, what's going to happen? My neighbors are going to think less of me. And it's like, it's this whole thing, but it works, right? Is this sounding familiar to what we talked about? Okay. Don't open this email. <laughs> they were number 10 on HubSpot. I don't know if you know HubSpot. HubSpot is a huge CRM worldwide, sends millions, uh, billions, literally billions of emails over a given year, millions of emails a day. Don't open this email was one of the top 10 subject lines sent from Manicube. <laughs> Wild, right? Number 12, Zillow, what can you afford? Another sort of same style. Somebody cares because if they're thinking about buying a home right now, they're stepping out from the crowd going, I'm thinking about what can I afford? I'm gonna click through on this to see. Even if Zillow's stats might be, you know, some crazy percentage off in various directions, we won't get into that nonsense. Right, or my other favorite, I'm not even a drinker, but where to drink beer right now? <laughs> Does all seem pretty important to the people that they're going to? It might not be important to every single person in the room or every single person in the list, but that's not your goal here. Your goal here is to get the percentage of the list who really does care and will buy that product to open the email, to first see it, then to open it, then to actually click through and do something, okay? So now, come on, you can do it. There we go. We're gonna have some, um, just sort of a process I want you to walk through every time um, that you are personally, sorry about that. Um, something I want you to walk through every single time that you're personally writing these emails, and this is something we do. Um, Write your copy, rewrite your copy, send a mock-up, cool off, and then send it. When I say cool off, I usually mean take a day, wait, then go reread it, then send the email, okay? Um, one of my, actually, one of my favorites, and this is, this is in a bunch of different books, but one of my favorites is the classic uh, Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I don't know if any of you have read the original version of it, there's a great story about Abraham Lincoln and how after his passing, they found a drawer. That was a drawer full of letters that Lincoln wrote and never sent. And amongst them was basically a letter to the South telling them to go screw themselves, kind of a moment, excuse them, whatever. But basically, this, this like long diatribe of at the time, it would have been basically an email telling the South to go screw, it doesn't really matter, we control the money anyways and do whatever the hell you want and we'll starve you out kind of a thing. What did he do? He waited a day, he cooled off, he reread it, and then he went and sent something that was much more apropos, right? Was not a, was not, but it was literally a drawer full, full, of these letters that he wrote, waited, and then sent. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, if a guy like that, along with, I can't tell you how many business professionals say the same thing, to wait and cool off before you send anything at all ever, please, please, please absolutely do that, all right? Now, I want to get into some techniques for how we're actually writing copy here, okay? So there are some things that we can do and say within the copy, within the writing, that trigger some responses. And this is that same direct response concept that we had um, that you'll, you know, that we'll talk about that we already talked about before in headlines, we're gonna readdress here uh, in, inside of the writing. So first of all is a limited time offer. Any folks run limited time offers in the room? You have, all right, how'd that work? Tell us about it. Okay, so specials for a certain season, discounts for the fall, discounts for the, okay. 
What I'm talking is more, more uh, urgency. The next 10 people to come sign up get the first three months for free. Kind of an offer. The first five people to come do this get the next six months free. Because out of those six or five or whatever it is that you're going to give away for six months, you're probably going to end up keeping whatever percentage of them after that as your clients. But then on top of that, if you can draw 100 people through the door by offering to give away five, well, you've more than just made your money back, right? So the urgency in terms of season is, that's not bad. That's not a bad way to do it, a, a sort of an urgency offer. But we're talking true, like, buy this today or else this offer is going away and you'll never see it again kind of offers, right? Those are the kinds of things we're talking about in terms of creating immediacy. Like, when we do free book giveaways, and I hate to say this, but I'll, I'll be blunt with everybody, we could have a stack of 100 books and we'll run an ad saying, the next five people that sign up are going to get a book for free. We're, we're low on numbers of books that we have and can only set it up where the next five people get these books for free. Is anything I just said there a lie? Nope, not one bit. Was it even misleading? Nope. But did it create urgency? We have a limited number of books. Is 100 a limited number compared to a million? Sure, it's a limited number, right? Only five spots are going to get books. We just created even more urgency on top of that, right? We go from there. That's the sort of urgency that I'm talking about. Now, some of these, most will buy if, right? These are the ones where um, I'll take it back to the, the gym sort of idea of most people will buy this if they're committed to getting rid of their dad bot. We'll use just the same example that we talked about before, okay? Um, other, any other industry examples people want me to use or people working in, things like that? The other one that we, and people have some tricks with this, you can only buy if. We'll actually say we'll put in emails and, and qualify people right there. You can only buy this if your X, Y, Z, so on and so forth, create exclusivity, right? We're only looking to sell this artwork to tr true connoisseurs. We're not, this gallery, right? Some galleries I know in the area are open by uh, appointment only, right? Those sorts of things. A lot of those don't really need to do any marketing, but we'll get past that. But you can say stuff like, you can only buy this if you're a true connoisseur. And people start going, well, wait, am I a true, I don't know. I want to be a true connoisseur. Do you think they'll let me into their exclusive club of being a true connoisseur of art? Let's find out, right? Again, you're creating that direct response. And the last one, only some can qualify. Is you're starting to get where I'm going with this, the notion of this, of getting people to we call that the intimidation. The next one is what we call selling money at a discount. Um, this is basically saying strategy three is demonstrate and uh, sorry, two is demonstrate ROI and three is ego appeals. So demonstrate ROI is basically if you've done this in your business before and it has had X results, you can actually go out and say, hey, Spend money, make this money. This is, this is what we've seen in this set of results. And then always have the disclaimer, these results may vary, blah, 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 blah. Legal disclaimer, right? Results may vary by whatever. I'm not going to be the legal person. But that's what we call the essentially demonstrate ROI and sell money at a discount. And then strategy three is ego appeals. So this is what is the no normal keeping up with the Joneses kind of a thing. Right? Have you been noticing X, Y, and have you noticed that all your neighbors have a pool, but you don't <laughs> kind of stuff? And you might not want to be that crass with it, but 
there are ads or there are specific emails that can start being sent of things in the notion of, hey, you know, are you, have you noticing all your neighbors uh, swimming and relaxing in their pools this summer? Or Jay, maybe it's for boats, right? And the boat company that works with you sends an email that says, are you noticing all your friends and neighbors having an amazing time out on their boat this summer, but never thought you could afford one? Does that sound similar to a subject line that we talked about, that we said before, right? So now it's ego appeals. Here's how you can afford a boat. Here's how we can help you do that. Here's how we can, and don't, don't let me sell you on a boat because it is probably the worst investment beyond I, you can ever <laughs> you can ever make ever. <laughs> so don't, I'm not gonna go into that. If you love boats though, man, boats are awesome. I have a ton of fun on them. Um, the other one we really are uh, happy with and offer, um, is some sort of strong guarantee, some sort of strong money back guarantee on this, right? Whereby it's, you know, basic money back guarantee, refund, keep the premium. If, if you're not happy with this in 60 days, we'll guarantee X. If you're not, whatever, those kinds of guarantees. Because, I mean, right? Everybody, uh, I'm not, I'm gonna get the, the name of the movie wrong. Oh my God, why am I blanking on this? Brothers can't be friends. Brothers got a hug. Come on, somebody. Yeah, and, uh, oh my God. Step, no, it's not Step Brothers. It's the other one before that. With, um, oh God, this is going to kill me. In any event, somebody will give me this. Maybe even in, maybe even that. No, 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 no. It's the father dies. It's, he's going around trying to sell car parts. Tommy boy, Tommy boy, thank you, Tommy boy, right? And what does the guy specifically say? People like a guarantee on the box. That hasn't changed in 30 years. And he says, well, yeah, I can stick my head up or whatever, and I'm not going to try to do that quote, right? But the notion of direct response and guarantees sell has not changed in that amount of time. Okay, people like guarantees. They like knowing. In fact, uh, this just happened with rugs recently. Um, my mom, living over in St. Jay, came over to Burlington, went to one of the rug shops here, was looking at them, looking at them, said, boy, I really like this rug, and she's amazing with color. But she said, you know, I'm not sure it's going to be perfect where, where I am in the home. And she said, and I can order from the store online. And they offer me a 90-day money-back guarantee. They even pay for shipping. So why, why would I buy it from you in this store when I could just order it online? If I don't like it, they offer me a guarantee. What'd the guy do? He said, I'll offer you the same guarantee. She said, okay, money on the table, done deal. Right? But that was in her mind. That money-back guarantee is what made that deal. If that guy in the store had said, well, sorry, we don't offer money back guarantees here. That's not part of our, that's not part of what we do. Um, you know, if you like it, that's great. If not, you know, you could resell it here, which we've seen plenty of antique stores do, right? Right? That was the difference between her going, and because my mom's the type, if she cannot buy something online, she will not. She wants to give every piece of business to a local vendor that she can, and I'm all for her. Like, I'm all with her for that. But, at some point, when the local vendor just flat out cannot compete with the person online, it's really hard to start making those same decisions. So don't be afraid to make some sort of money back guarantee because all the masters tell me, and from my experience, it makes you way more money than you ever have to return on some sort of guarantee return. Keep going back to that. All right. And the last one is tell a story. And this goes back to the whole email should be coming from me. Okay, people love stories. And when we get to this point, I get the question a lot, which is, how long should my email be, Alex? Have we all been wondering that, right? Like how long should it be, like two sentences or paragraph or five paragraphs or what's too long on an email? 
Do you know what my answer is? There's no length on interesting. Think about, think about the interesting books that you've read in your life. Right? You pick them up, you read the first sentence, and before you know it, you're at chapter three. And it felt like 30 seconds went by. Now think about the terrible books you've, re you've read. Right? You pick them up, you read the first three sentences, and then you read the first three sentences again to make sure they were that, that terrible, and then you try to go through the next three pages, and it feels like an hour when it's really been 20 minutes, right? There is really no length on captivating. I have seen emails that are two lines that are incredibly successful. I've seen emails that are literally pages that are successful, okay? There is no, there is no length on interesting. This is actually, this is straight from the old school direct response masters, from Dan Kennedy, from Craig Fort, from some of the, the guys who have done this for, you know, 50, these are guys who were doing it for 20 years before I've been doing it for 15 years. And I don't even look old enough to have been doing this for 15 years. So just, I promise you, no length on interesting. All right? I keep wanting to go there to... Yes? Absolutely. So you, okay, we're going to get into that. It's funny you said that. So there are two types of people who read, uh, when you're reading an email, there are two different types of people. You're an analytical person. Am I wrong? I'm right. <laughs> I guess I'm right. There are two types of people, okay, when they're reading emails. One is like this gentleman here, and your name, I, I, Jim? Jim? Tim, Tim. So Tim, what we do is this, okay? Every start to every, say, paragraph, or line or bullet line, we highlight, we bold. So for someone like Tim, Tim can read the first sentence of every paragraph in that email, get all the information he needs to know about that email, and then make the decision as to whether he wants to go back and read all the information in detail. Because that's probably what you do, right? You skim, 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 and then go, okay, yeah, that's interesting. Let me go back and read the whole thing throughout, right? So that's a trick in writing copy. I'm really glad you brought that up, Tim. Thank you. So that's a trick in writing your copy is as you write, and if they do turn into longer emails, make sure that first sentence, the most important thing, the bullet point item, is truly you know, bolded or bulleted or something that that person can literally just go point, 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 point. But the, for the person who's not analytical, for the person who's more empathetic or spiritual on that side, they tend to be somebody who will read every line, every sentence throughout the entire thing, right? And that's a way to catch both of them if you're doing that and how you're writing your emails. And this is, you notice how you, you said this at the exact right time? You happen to be the analytical guy. The other one's the compulsive type who will read the entire thing, okay? So now this is what's called a double readership path. Meaning for the folks that are analytical, they have one readership path of those bullet, 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 then they read the whole thing. For the people who are more of the compulsive, the emp empathetic or, or spiritual type, they tend to be the compulsive who will read the entirety of that whole email. Just, just how we are. And the last piece I want to say in writing your copy is to say it and then say it again and then say it again. And I don't mean this just in terms of multiple times in the same email, I mean multiple times in the same sentence. Think about this. We're gonna offer you today a 100% free, money back, no cost guarantee. How many times did I just say that was free in one sentence? 100% free, no cost, money back. I said that thing is free four different times, and Grammarly would be screaming their heads off at me going, Alex, what are you doing? You just said 100% free. My, my high school and college English teachers are going, Alex, there's no such thing as not 100% free. It's either free or it's not, right? It's either, there's no 100% free that doesn't exist. But when we're talking about direct response marketing and actual email marketing, 
you want to say it multiple times because the 100% resonates with one person, the free resonates with another, the guarantee resonates with another, the money back resonates with another, and to be honest, we're all humans. We need to get banged on the head a couple times before things that really sink in. And using that trick, you then even amongst the copy, want to use those same sorts of, sorts of things multiple times. So at the top, 100% free, free guarantee. And then at the bottom, free money back, no cost guarantee. Right? So you're telling them multiple times in the email and in the sentence itself that you're working inside of. All right? So as I said, don't be afraid to frustrate your English teachers because I'll tell you, it works. 100% works. I, <laughs> I had to reteach myself. I'm one of those very, you know, everything, cross the T, dot the I, everything, grammar has to be perfect. Like, I'm the type that'll like, you know, correct my own grammar on text messages kind of person. Like, that's me, but, <laughs> right? That's not direct response marketing. That's not getting people to actually respond to an email because most people are not like that. You have that and in some niches and in some industries that you sell to, like we talked about neuroscience or engineers or folks like that who might have their own language. But for the mass populace, how do you normally write an email? Now, let me ask you this. We'll get, get down to some basics here. How many of you are addressing your emails, dear so-and-so? Anybody? Nobody? Is it just their name? Sometimes it's dear. Some of us do that, right? Maybe hi there, hi so-and-so, hey John. But let me ask, right? How do you address your emails when you send them from your personal, like you writing me an email versus you writing a marketing email? Are they different? Do you say like, hi Alex in your personal emails and dear Alex in your marketing emails? Or are they the same? Because if they're not the same, that's the first trigger. I know it's not you. Or how many emails do you respond to people with nothing? No, hi, Alex. Just the line to start on your personal emails. Well, then all of a sudden, I get an email from you out of the blue that says, hi, Alex. And I go, wait a minute. Jay or, Jay or John or Tim never sends me an email that says, hi, whatever. He just starts writing. The hell is he sending me that? Oh, it's a marketing email. Okay, mind triggered, turned off. We're on to the next. In fact, a lot of the emails that we send, we make it look, we'll send through a MailChimp or a big automated group, but we'll take off those big glossy banners. We'll make it look like it's a personal text coming email coming from me. It'll have the unsubscribe and all the requirements at the very bottom, but it still looks like it's a personal email from my inbox. Okay, now I'll give you some little tech, tech, trip, tech tricks on how to do that right after this. So if you're improving readability, I talked about Grammarly. Another great option is readable.io, right? Um, there's a, an op option a lot of email providers is called extending the headline. And we are just about to be wrapping up on time, which is just about to be perfect. Um, so we talked a lot about sort of deadlines, discount for fast response. This is a lot of the stuff where I'm, I'm sort of reevaluating. We're talking about this again, okay? We have, like we talked about, limited availability, mediums. You want to uh, spark some sort of action with these folks. Come on, move forward. Okay, so after we get these emails in, and this is where this gets really powerful, we start them on an automated email sequence, okay? So we've gotten their email. Now we start them on an automated email sequence. We use a company called MailChimp for this. They're the, the actual people that do it for us. A lot of your CRMs or other products, there are a lot of folks out there that do this. But the trick here is through that sequence, you wanna create some sort of attractive character and at every step of the way, you want to offer some sort of piece of bait to them 
to keep them coming for the next email. Let me give you an example. So we'll go back to the gym, gym one as an example, right? You've gotten somebody who's in who's interested in possibly losing that dad bod because of the report or the video that you just came out with, right? And you write this email that says, and your name, Nate. Um, hey everybody, or hi, you know, hi John, or hey Sue, or whatever it is. Thank you so much for uh, signing up for that report. Just sent it to your inbox. You should have it. Um, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it took me a long time to write this report, and it's been blah 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 through my trials and tribulations of getting the gym started, and it's been so rewarding helping all of these wonderful folks that are doing X, Y, and Z, and because it's been so rewarding helping all those people, I'm going to be putting together a video on the top 10 things you can do to avoid getting that dad bod in the first place, or whatever it might be. Be on the lookout, I should have this done in the next week or so, be on the lookout for my next email, which will have this next piece of value that I'm going to give you. Now people are actually looking for that next email in the sequence. You've set them up to look for that next email that you're going to get from them. Remember how I said we had like, you know, 35 or 40 emails over 255 days? Those are those kinds of emails, okay, where we're sending them to people consistently, okay? Now, I want to show you just, we'll, we'll end on a piece of actual proof here of what happens when you do it this way. Now the old list I acquired, not a whole ton I can do and I'm actually proud to get our numbers up to where they are. So I took that list of 80,000 that was getting about a 2% um, actual click-through rate and a less than 0% cl like actual click like so less than 2% open rate and at less than a percent click through. We've gotten that up to about 10%, 10% um, open and 2% click through. But let's look at our ongoing series, the ones we're talking about right now, okay? Ongoing. So the same system that we just talked about, okay? 67% opens, 57% click through, 79% open, 9.3 click through. Now these are some new ones, so obviously. We, had, we sent this list, okay? 13 of the 15 people that opened, that actually got the email, opened and clicked through on it. Okay, now let's go down to some of the ones that have been sending for a very, very long time. Uh, da, 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 da. That's not the one. This. Sorry. Sorry, there are two pages here, I believe. Or they just didn't load them. There's one. Let me find it. Hold on here. Sorry, folks. But, I mean, you're seeing how this, the sort of numbers that we're actually looking at in terms of when you do it in this sequence where you create bait, you create those sorts of things. And let me ask you, have the folks in the room ever seen the, like, 60% open rate kind of stuff that we're talking about here on their email campaigns? We have one. And is it because you do it in a similar method? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yep, exactly. So we just have another person in the room who said, yeah, I see this and it's because I do it in this very similar way. Interesting, isn't it? Awesome. Let me show you one more though. I am gonna find this one. Um, I think they're actually just limiting number on page because I'm on a weird size screen here. There it is. So this is the one that we originally set up. 
This is our very first one that I brought when, when I joined into the company. Over that time period, we have seen a 41% open and a 12.5% click through. And that's on welcoming a brand new person to our general blog website. This right here is over 5,000 opens that we've seen on this one campaign and these sort of numbers over that campaign. So absolutely possible, right? Been sending since 2017, April of 2017, and we're seeing these sort of rates coming through on them. That's, that's what I'm saying, folks, is if you can build that piece of bait, bring them into that piece of information, right? There are a lot of new masters. This is nothing new. Like I said, Dan Kennedy started it. Russell Brunson, sort of the new kid on the block in terms of, you know, rewriting his books and so on. It's, it's the same people over and over. Um, but I just want to show you that little bit of sort of social proof at the end there. Um, and I want to show you one little automation trick before we wrap it up. And I know we're right at the end of our time here. Is that all right, Jay? Sure. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you a little trick for MailChimp. Okay. So we've talked about the automated sequences. They cycle over whatever time, right? Follow-ups, all that sort of stuff. Um, you're promising them other bait items. You're tracking all of this. Recapped again. Ah, went one slide too forward. Sorry, folks. Basically, the concept, the trick that I wanted to give you, and I might have even deleted it out. I hope I didn't delete the slide. In any event, the trick I wanted to give you is this. So, if you're using a MailChimp, or another provider it becomes really difficult because all of a sudden you're running your own normal email address like alex at agentinnercircle.com and now I'm telling you well you're supposed to be sending emails from MailChimp as Alex how the heck do you do that right it's weird because you're gonna want to create some other email address that is a support at, info at, all those other types of email addresses, right? And send from that using your big list vendors. And, and it might, now let me tell you, it might say reply to Alex at, but is the actual sender Alex at, or is the sender info at, or support at, or so on? Most of, you, most of the folks who are using MailChimp right now would actually be the sender is actually support at or info at, whatever your main account info is at, right? Well, here's what we did. We created aliases to all of our email addresses. So my real personal email address is alex at agent inner circle. But guess what? I created another magical email address called alexc at agentinnercircle.com. And that's the one I dedicated to MailChimp. So when people start getting emails from me, it's coming from Alex C at agentinnercircle.com. And when you respond to that email, it's not like it goes to some support desk or whatever desk or things like that. I get a reply to it. My team gets a reply to it. So it can be dealt with appropriately. Plus Gmail and all those other guys think, oh, this came from Alex C. It actually came to him from a sender email address not just this is the reply to, okay? So you can manage your emails that way. And on that note, I wanna leave you with one thought, all right? At the end of the day, we're all humans here. The kinds of marketing that work, work across all mediums. So a lot of the stuff we taught today and we talked about today has to do with email specifically, but that doesn't mean you can't apply it to a lot of the other uh, marketing and advertising and things that you can do. Stuff we talked about for headlines in email work for headlines in Facebook ads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so don't think of this as just email. Think a lot about what we talked about today as conceptual type stuff. And that being said, there are a couple different paths. Either one, you can go here, give me your email addresses, and you're more than welcome to uh, get a PDF copy of the slides. 
or you're welcome to give me your business cards and I will send them to you. One way or the other, both work for me, whatever's easiest for you. So agentinnercircle.com slash old dash new dash work. And that's it folks. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope you have a wonderful, amazing and phenomenal day. Thanks everybody on live too. Oh, of course. Thank you. Hey, good to meet you, Nate.